Uh, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about what ADHD is and is not. <clears throat> Once you have a diagnosis of ADHD, it is not a moral failing or an untreatable permanent problem. It's not completely genetic, although uh, studies show a 78 to 80 percent heritability. It's not a made-up problem, as some critics claim. It's not completely bad, uh, and it's uh, quali not qualitatively different from normal characteristics that everybody has. We all uh, are a little bit distractible. We all have some attention lapses. We all tend to be a little hyperactive at times. The, the problem is that uh, this may be too much of a good thing. Uh, it is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's chronic and long-lasting, but not an untreatable permanent problem. It's partly, it is partly genetic, but it's also partly environmental. And it's important to remember, uh, we don't fall into the trap of genetic determinism, that there's nothing we can do about it because it's genetic. Remember that genes are only expressed by interacting with the environment. For example, in PKU, a completely uh, inherited, genetic, completely genetic disorder of metabolism, uh, it's only a problem in an environment that has phenylalanine in the diet. That's why we do the diaper test. If we discover that an infant has phenylketonuria, we can prevent the worst of the problems by giving a special diet. There are things that uh, the, can be done environmentally uh, that will alleviate or m mitigate the problem. There is a real problem documented scientifically, of course. Uh, I'd like to uh, expand a little bit on the final point here, that the disorder is quantitative, not qualitative. It involves a passing a threshold. If we take a, an analogy of blood pressure, everybody has a blood pressure. Without it, you'd be dead. And the American Heart Association has established that 120 over 80 is the threshold for hypertension. If you have a pressure higher than that, that's considered hypertension or at least pre-hypertension. You can have a mild case like 125 over 85 or a severe case like 130 over 100. But notice that a mild case is more like normal than like a severe case. There's similar response to stress. Under stress, blood pressure increases. Under stress, ADHD symptoms get worse. On a good day, the severity of either blood pressure or ADHD drops. That means that ADHD symptoms may appear to wax and wane. Uh, they'll appear to be there sometimes and sometimes not. However, for a diagnosis, they have to uh, occur frequently and in more than one setting. The severity helps to determine the treatment plan. There are several types of treatment. Medication is uh, one of the most common. Uh, the stimulant drugs like uh, methylphenidate and amphetamine give you a pretty much uh, immediate relief and uh, in some cases pretty dramatic relief. Then there's behavioral treatment, which works a little more slowly, but uh, also has less side effects. Lifestyle hygiene is very important. Things like uh, sleep, children, uh, young children need 10 hours of sleep, adolescents need nine hours, adults eight hours. Most people are getting about an hour less than they should. And sleep deficits, sleep uh, shortage, can mimic ADHD symptoms or make symptoms worse in someone who has ADHD. Diet is very important. With the Mediterranean type diet with few processed foods and a lot of uh, vegetables and fruit also makes a difference. Uh, and then we have other complementary and alternative treatments. Uh, for severe uh, urgent cases, 
medication provides a quick relief for about 90% of cases. But for non-urgent cases, it's probably better to start with behavioral treatment because uh, research has shown that some people respond well enough to behavioral treatment that they don't need the medication. And it's a more uh, permanent type of result. Uh, and also, if they do need medication, they need less of it, uh, a lower optimal dose, so that there are less side effects. Then medication can be added to the behavioral treatment as needed. Lifestyle hygiene is, is important, as I mentioned. It's important to eliminate screen time for a couple of hours before bedtime because the blue light that's emitted from uh, screens of most devices and uh, color television uh, tends to delay the onset of melatonin, which is the natural way that the brain tells you to go to sleep uh, when the sun goes down. Being on a video game or other screens will tend to prevent onset of sleep. Uh, exercise is very important. It reduces inflammation and it increases in a natural way the same catecholamine neurotransmitters that the stimulant medication targets. Uh, stimulant medicines prevent the reuptake and breakdown of the catecholamines and exercise uh, increases the release of those into the uh, synapse so that uh, you get more uh, neurotransmission involved. The diet I already mentioned, uh, sugar is uh, a problem because of causing inflammation. The role of sugar, uh, artificial uh, sugar, has been somewhat controversial. However, uh, we're coming increasingly to the conclusion that it is a problem. One of, one of the problems was in early studies, it was compared to aspartame, an artificial sweetener that also uh, has a detrimental effect on behavior. So it's important if you if you're avoiding sugar not to use artificial sweeteners in place of the sugar, which tends to rule out most uh, so-called soft drinks, the uh, sodas, the, the pop, um, which either has 50 grams of sugar in a bottle, uh, which is uh, like uh, five teaspoons, or has the artificial sweetener, which is about as bad. The diet should emphasize fruits, vegetables, and the the sugar naturally in fruit is not a problem because of other components of the fruit that uh, tend to help uh, control the worst effects of it. Uh, vegetables, of course, whole grains, and some protein, especially fish. The uh, wild ocean oily fish is probably the best to use, but not deep fried uh, because the effect on the fat from the high temperature tends to produce uh, the trans fatty acids, which are bad for general health and as well as brain health. Uh, you need to ensure adequate vitamins, minerals, and omega-3 essential fatty acids. Other treatment considerations include co-occurring disorders. Uh, and one of the uh, big ones here is learning disorder. You can have a, a dyslexia or other learning disorder. Dyscalculia is the fancy name for a math learning disorder or expressive writing disorder. Developmental coordination disorder is not exactly a learning disorder, but it can interfere with uh, things like being able to play sports, for example. And if academic achievement is not adequate, a psychoeducational assessment should be useful uh, if it's not already done. Because ADHD is chronic, the treatment planning needs to consider the long haul. And this involves making the child the star of the therapeutic team. It's important to have the child or adolescent's cooperation with treatment because they will eventually need to be responsible for their own treatment as adults. They should be included in the treatment planning from the beginning.
Well, thank you, doctor. So when a parent has learned all of this new information and she's coming to a specialist such as yourself, how is how can she start the conversation about treatment? Okay, well, one thing is to ask the uh, clinician who's made the diagnosis uh, what treatments they're familiar with. Uh, some may not be familiar, for example, with behavioral treatment and may need to refer you. Busy pediatricians in particular don't, have, don't really have time to do a lot of behavioral treatment themselves. Uh, they have to see another patient every 15 minutes or, or whatever, uh, whatever their schedule is. So they may either have someone on the staff that they can delegate that to, or they may refer out to someone else, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or perhaps a, an ADHD coach to set up a behavioral treatment plan. Uh, also, uh, not every clinician is familiar with the lifestyle treatments that I mentioned. Uh, they may know about them, but they may not think to bring them up. So uh, you may need to either do that on your own or uh, seek uh, help from, a, for example, a dietitian may help with organizing a palatable, uh, tasty diet, which would be good for the whole family in place of, of what's been done. You, you may need to uh, check with uh, the local why about some sort of uh, exercise program, maybe a sports program. Uh, if the child has developmental coordination disorder, a, an occupational therapist might be helpful with that. It's, uh, it's important to consider the whole spectrum of possible treatments. You just mentioned a lot about the behavioral management part. What about the medication management part? Um, Talking with the doctor about medication for a child can be kind of intimidating. Do you have some tips for a parent to start that conversation? It would be important to make sure that the prescriber has complete, adequate information. And one of those keys is to get input from the teacher who has other children to compare to and sees the child in one of the most stressful situations, which is in a classroom with a lot of distractions around and the need to concentrate on a work assignment and complete it and stay organized. So the teacher has a lot of valuable observations. And that can be done in several ways. One is a daily report card in which the teacher sends home, uh, and by the way, this is one of the effective behavioral interventions too. Um, the teacher sends home a note each day which uh, says what the child has succeeded at on three or four key uh, behavioral uh, things like if this particular child has trouble staying in their seat that might be one of the things that the teacher scores another child may have a different problem maybe talking out in class or maybe not uh, paying attention to the assigned uh, work, uh, seat work in class, but uh, looking off to the neighbors or looking out the window or whatever. So whatever that particular child's problem is most uh, salient, most noticeable, that could be one of the targets for this daily report card. Anyhow, that would be useful information to bring to the doctor. Another thing is a possible rating scale. Uh, there are, for example, the SNAP uh, is the list of 18 diagnostic symptoms uh, that are scored from zero to three, and it's available for free on the internet uh, at ADHD.net. Ideally, some direct communication between the teacher and prescriber would be nice, but that's not always possible, and these other things would would suffice to, to bring that information. It's also important to have information for, if the child is in Little League or Scouts, to have information from the Scout leader or the coach or whatever, uh, or just the parent's observations of what the child's doing there. The prescriber may not have the time to reach out and get all this information themselves. So if you make their job easier, they'll do a better job of prescribing. Now, it's important to remember that 
it's not like taking an antibiotic where you uh, have a certain dose that you take for a certain number of days and that's it. In this case, you need to start with a low dose and work gradually up to find the optimal dose for a given person. The problem is that some people respond to a very low dose and some need a very high dose. There's about a tenfold difference in the optimal dose from the most uh, extreme uh, low to the most extreme high. Uh, also, not everybody responds to the first medicine tried. So after trying various doses, if the result is not satisfactory, there may you may need to try a different one. If you start with methylphenidate, you may need to try amphetamine. If you started with amphetamine, you may need to go to methylphenidate. If you try both of those, in, in uh, different doses, about 90% will have a good response. There's still a small group, maybe 10%, who don't respond to the stimulants, but might respond to something like atomoxetine, a non-stimulant. There's a new non-stimulant out now, viloxetine also, or uh, guanfacine, which uh, is a completely different mode of action. Uh, and uh, those can be tried in various doses also. So I have heard that work, using both behavior management and medication management together gives us the best results for the majority of children. Um, many parents want to begin with behavior management and then add in medication management. How do you suggest uh, having that conversation with the doctor? Which, which modality do you start with? Should we start with both? Should we start with one and then add another in? Yeah, I think uh, as, the consum as a consumer, you have the right to say what you would prefer to, to do. You, you get recommendations from the clinician who may feel strongly one way or another, but ultimately you have the, the right to say, this is what I would prefer to do. And it may not be the right choice. You know, Maybe the, the clinician knows something that you hadn't thought about and they, can, they might be able to give you reasons for their recommendation. But generally, most clinicians will go along with uh, the preference of the patient or the parent of the patient and, um, and help you to, to find, for example, if you want to start with behavioral treatment, help you to find that. If that doesn't do, do the job, then maybe you'll come back to their recommendation, whatever it is. So when a parent comes to the doctor and, again, uh, trying to figure out everything, uh, having done their reading, they've asked their questions, sometimes it can feel a little intimidating talking to a doctor. Is there something that you would suggest a parent say or bring with her or do to begin that conversation? One thing you could do is to bring some ammunition with you to show that you've been reading up on it. Now, there is a danger to surfing the web because there's in misinformation there also as well. However, the Chad National Resource Center has uh, a vetted information. We have a panel of experts, a uh, professional advisory board, that uh, checks out all the information available there. It's sponsored by the CDC. So that would be a good uh, scientifically based source of information. And you could come armed with printouts uh, of uh, various things and show it to the doctor. Since you uh, come across then as someone who is informed, uh, that will tend to, to earn the respect of any good clinician and uh, will help to promote a, a kind of partnership in which uh, you have a consultant, the clinician, and then you can make uh, decisions about w what to do, how to proceed. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Arnold. I think this has been very helpful. I think our audience members have learned a lot and have, as you said, uh, have enough now that they can go and be partners in their child's medical care. Thank you.